Hi kids, it's Mrs. Frable. How are you? Yeah, me too. Hey, um, today we're going to talk about the next phylum of animals. Woohoo! We're moving on up the evolutionary chain. You should have done the starter questions. Um, on my online students, you should have done your starter questions before coming to this video. So if you have not done those, please pause this right now and go answer these questions. Oh, wait, it's fine. Come on back. Okay, are you back? Okay, uh, so the answers to those starter questions are thus. What kind of sim body symmetry do cnidarians have? And if you don't know what a cnidarian is, go back and do the previous two weeks work, okay? Uh, these guys have radial symmetry. Uh, two body forms of cnidarians, of course you know these, polyp and medusa, bloop, bloop, right? Um, that you should answer thoughtfully. Uh, what is one thing you can commit to doing to lessen your personal impact on climate change? There were many things that we talked about in class last week. What can you do? What will you do? What would you do? What will you do? Do something, right? Okay, and then um, I would like you just to practice formatting um, scientific names properly because I'm still getting some incorrect ones on your prezies. Terciops truncatus, you should have capital T, on the genus name, lowercase t on the species name, and that should all be italicized. Corvus branchiorhynchus, Corvus branchiorhynchus, and Beta splendens. And if you don't know what these are, uh, that's a dolphin. That is a crow raven. It's a corvid of some sort. <laughs> remember. And then that is a fish. That's a beta fish. Okay. All right. Without further ado, Let's talk about worms. So uh, I always debate with, with myself as to whether I'm going to do these little phyla that, that maybe aren't very impressive or fun. Uh, but phylum platyhelminthes are the flatworms, and they were a major step in evolution um, in quite a few different ways. And uh, uh, fun fact, you, you, you evolved from, from one of these guys. Uh, they were, after a few hiccups and bumps and misstarts in evolution, way back a few hundred million years ago, um, the, the flatworms emerged as a supremely successful group, and they're still around. And uh, in fact, you get to play with some in the lab next week. Oh, if you're working at home um, on Thursday, please stay tuned for what I'll have you do if you're not going to be in class for the lab, okay? Okay, let's talk about worms. Woo! General characteristics for the phylum platyhelminthes are thus, and these are the things that you will need to list on your Prezi. Don't go googling characteristics of platyhelminthes because it might not be what I want you to know. These are the things I want you to know for this phylum. These guys have bilateral symmetry. You can cut them in half from their uh, posterior to their anterior ends and you get two mirrored sides. Um, they, that's the first group that we've seen with that, right? Uh, these guys also step it up one level of organization. They do have some organs, not a lot, but they have a few organs. They have a head. This is the first time we see a head. Now let's, let's define cephalization. That just means that at one end of the body, it's generally the anterior end of the body, there is a collection of sensory organs and sensory structures and uh, also neuronal material. So we get things like eyes, we get things like olfactory senses, that's smell, we might get some other chemo senses like taste, um, and then uh, some brain matter as well, either a complex brain or in these guys' case, they just have simple little ganglia little blobs of neurons, but they have a head. They have a collection of those senses at one end of their body. These guys still have an incomplete gut though, just like the cnidarians. It's one opening in, same opening out. And these guys are dorsoventrally flattened. Now what that means, dorso, remember, is the back. Ventral is the, the lower part, right? You squish them that way. They are dorsoventrally flattened. And these are um, hermaphroditic or monoecious animals. So they have both male and female reproductive structures in every body. They reproduce both sexually and asexually. So we'll go through that. Okay. Uh, their body plans, these guys again have bilateral symmetry. And if you cut one in half, which a lot of, a lot of people have done that. 
um, they still have that kind of similar structure that, that cnidarians have where they have an ectoderm and then they have a gastroderm layer and then they have the mesoderm. The difference is in their mesoderm they have some other structures and some other, they, they get some organs in there as well. Um, they're, how are they different from cnidarians? They're not radial, they're bilateral and they have some organs, okay? All right, uh, so how do these guys make more of themselves? It gets so complicated with these guys, you guys. I'll go through how each class does it. It gets weird, but uh, basically, and they have, um, they're monoecious, monoecious. They have both, uh, both sexes, um, reproductive organs in each body. So they have um, ovaries that make eggs right there. And an oviduct is what an egg travels down to get out of the body. And then they also have seminal vesicles and vas deferens, which is where sperm are made. So they, all these worms have both of those structures, but they don't self, they don't self um, fertilize generally. Uh, there's two different kinds of flatworms and I'll go through them in a minute, but some of them are parasites and some of them are um, predators. And the parasitic ones have really complicated reproductive lifestyles and life cycles and it involves different hosts for different phases in their metamorphosis and they, they get pooped out by one host and get ingested by another host and continue their life cycle. So Okay. And sometimes it can be pretty harmful. Okay. What else? And uh, these guys are also asexually reproductive as well. You can cut them in half, get all kinds of new worms all the time. Lots of them. Okay. okay. Uh, and they also have incredible powers of regeneration, which I'll talk about in just a sec. Uh, so reproduction, um, they just exchange sperm. They keep their own eggs. They exchange sperm, take the sperm from the other individual, fertilize their eggs with it, and release those eggs. Uh, some of them also uh, are ovoviviparous, so they'll release larvae. Um, and then they're fertilized eggs, you guys. And some of these, they look, uh, they develop their first stage of metamorphosis. is called a Mueller's larvae. It looks like a cartoon dog. For real. This is what it looks like. It's like a little basset hound. Tiny. Okay. Mueller's larvae. Now that regeneration thing I talked about, these guys have incredible healing powers. They can regenerate their bodies almost from nothing, almost. Uh, there is a limit to how many segments you can cut them into, but you can cut up a flatworm and you will then get that many new flatworms. Um, I think the limit is four or five. I've never done the regeneration because I don't like cutting things up that are alive. Uh, but you can you can do all kinds of things. These have been really important to medical science in trying to uh, discover the secret of regeneration. How do you grow new body parts when you've lost a body part? That is something that animals can do. Many groups can do up through um, up through invertebrate or amphibians can regrow limbs. So that that's handy. That's handy. And if we can harness that genetic technology. That might make a lot of people's lives easier, right? So uh, these guys are kind of really good at that. Their nervous system is pretty simple, but they do have a very rudimentary brain. The free living species are, uh, they have a pretty well developed sensory system because they are predators. So they'll have eyes, not like ours, not eyeballs. They'll have eye spots a little more advanced than what we saw with jellyfish. Um, and then they have these uh, primitive brains. They are collections of neurons that we call ganglia. And then they'll have these neurons that run through their whole body and they have little nerve cords. Um, they're, they're quite a major step up from that simple nerve net uh, of the cnidarians. Okay, again, eye spots. And so those are the predators, but the parasitic groups, generally they have really less elaborate systems. They don't have eyes. They might not have ganglia. Why do you think that is? Think about it for a minute. Okay. Why would a predator need or be more successful with a brain and eyes and well-developed coordination movements, but a parasite wouldn't? Okay. Parasites don't go anywhere. That's why. They get into a host, they latch on, and that is what is their protection. And 
that host is also usually their food source. So they don't really need to expend the energy to build these structures. Eyes are expensive to build, so are brains. So if you don't need one, it's advantageous not to spend that energy. Oh goodness, there's an emergency. Wow, okay, sorry about that kids. Um, I don't know if y'all got that text alert, but uh, apparently COVID-19 is at emergency levels in Utah right now. Today is November, uh, I'm sorry, it's October 30th. So, you know, party on, wear your masks, quit getting together. Thank you to those of you who have been following the rules. Okay, all right, back to the worms. Whew, man, you never know what's gonna happen in one of these videos. <laughs> okay, digestion and excretion. These guys, um, again, they have a blind gut, but their mouth is not where you think it might be because it's not in their head. Their mouth is actually on the ventral surface, the underside surface of their body, and it's usually more toward their tail. And they kind of act like a vacuum. Uh, they have this tube-like structure called a pharynx, and they that is a tube that sticks out of their um, mouth hole, their anus, and the, the pharynx will actually <laughs> suck up food. Okay, if they're predators, they'll use that to digest their prey, uh, their excretory system, they get rid of waste using um, flame cells, metanephridia flame cells and flame bulbs. Okay. All right, so that was their anatomy and a little bit of their phys uh, physiology. And you guys, that COVID alert just threw me for a loop. I don't like this. I don't like it at all. All right, let's keep learning about worms. Let's do the taxonomy of phylum platyhelminthes, shall we? Uh, there are one, two, three, four classes of flatworms. And um, we're, I'm gonna go through each of them really quickly. Again, I've underlined what I want you to have in your Prezi for each of the classes of platyhelminthes. Are you ready? First one. Oh, there's a video. I'll link it under this one. Ooh, go, here we go. Turbillaria, class Turbillaria. These are these are the pretty ones. These are the uh, these are the more predatory, free living, non parasitic kind. I gotta get out of the way. Where am I going? There. Uh, they do have the ganglia in their head, so they've got the primitive brain. And look at their cute little eyes. Okay. Uh, marine flatworms are beautiful creatures. They come in all sorts of colors and sizes. Some of them are quite large, free swimming in the ocean. They go along and vacuum stuff up. Um, and then there are also freshwater hammerhead flatworms that um, are, they're, they're about this big, but look at their funny little, little hammerhead. Very cute. Um, so these guys are predatory and uh, they are free living, non-parasitic. I apologize. I lied. I did not underline what I want you to have on, on this one, but you should write, you should put all of these down for the characteristics of Turbillaria. I'm fine. <laughs> oh, let me go back. Okay, so they are, uh, they do have ganglia and eye spots. They are predators and they are free living, non parasitic examples. Okay. Second class, Cestoda. These are tapeworms. These are the awful, horrible, icky, scary ones. Um, I'm not a fan. Uh, they, they do have an important place in um, ecology and in the circle of life because they help control populations because they can uh, they can take out a host. So they are uh, composed of these sections called proglottids, um, and they they're not their bodies aren't truly segmented, which we'll go into um, a little later on in the year when we get to phyla that are segmented. But proglottids are are little sections of their body and each animal can have three to four thousand proglottids and guess what those proglottids can do each of those can grow into a new tapeworm all by itself Oof. they also have a scolex oh, man. Scolex is this structure right here they have an anchor so uh again these guys are the parasitic ones, one of the parasitic groups. And um, tapeworms uh, especially like to infect mammals. All mammals have a species of tapeworm that will infect them. Um, and they can cause some serious, uh, serious health 
damage to their hosts, including starvation. Uh, they can also slowly poison a host. Um, the Skolex is uh, what they use to bury their alien faces into their host. Usually it's in the intestines. Okay, uh, again, parasites, terrible parasites, um, and they have quite a history um, with humans. Um, they can infect humans, other mammals. There are there's a special uh, species of tapeworm that infects whales. They're everywhere. Cats and dogs get them. Be really careful because these guys generally affect in the intestines, and uh, they'll attach their scolex, bury it into the interior intestine wall, and then they just hang out and proceed to digest and absorb all of the nutrients that the host animal is eating. And eventually that can lead to starvation and death. There's another video. You should watch it. Not a fan. Uh, they were actually once marketed, ooh, once upon a time, these guys were sold as diet pills. And if you don't believe me, there are videos about this where uh, you you could order, and I think there are some places you still can, you can order this miracle diet pill and in the mail would come this little dried up pill, this little like round looking tablet. And it would tell you to take this tablet just one time and then you would miraculously start losing weight. You know why? Because it wasn't proglotted. And it would grow into an all new worm and infect you and then you lose weight and get really sick you can actually die of sepsis from that okay so these guys have a really complicated life cycle so they uh as as organisms as a parasite that infect an intestinal system they are released from a, from their paras their host's body um through feces they get pooped out so um boy howdy don't handle poo like ever just don't handle poop. Uh, but they go through, uh, each proglottid contains packets of eggs. So the proglottid can develop into an adult worm. They also have far full of eggs. Oh, it's a mess. And uh, then they hatch and they go through several different metamorphous, metamorphic stages. Um, they can be passed to humans. So again, if you have cats and dogs, keep an eye on them. If you ever see you ever see something white hanging out of their out of their behind that's a worm you should get them treated take them to a vet uh, but just don't touch poo never touch poo ever okay uh yeah and then this cycle just continues okay uh trematodes Whew, thank god that's done class trematoda so these are flukes these are also um parasitic uh they're generally small they are uh they look like leeches but they are not leeches leeches are a totally different thing um these guys have a sucker at each end they use um one sucker to attach their bury their their mouth hole in and um the other one to just hang on to stuff Oof. Uh, they have a two, bra two branched gut that extends through the body. Uh, they don't have a very long pharynx because they essentially just absorb nutrients um, from the um, from their environment through their mouth, so they don't have to really go after stuff. Okay? And some of them don't have digestive systems at all. They just absorb nutrients right from a host's bloodstream. Yeesh. Okay. Uh, they can have up to four need, not have, they need four different hosts and different larval types throughout their life cycle. Um, there's, there's diseases associated with them. Schistosomiasis is one species, and this uh, causes a lot of problems in um, places in the world that don't have access to clean drinking water um, or, or hygienic food prep. Um, these guys... Poof, I don't know why I struggle with this so bad. They bore into the skin of a host, and then they travel through the blood vessels, through the vascula vasculatory and circulatory system. Um, they find the heart, the lung, and the kidneys, and then they attach, and then the, they just sit and drink your blood. And then um, that causes inflammation. Um, eggs are 
eggs are released, eggs get trapped in the host's muscle uh, tissues and that can cause infection. So this can be a problem too with um, some of some of the um, some of the animal products that we eat. In some countries schistosomiasis worms are present um, in the dirt with that whole life cycle and it can infect cows and pigs I believe and then if humans are eating the meat and not cooking the meat well enough those eggs can then be transferred into the human body and cause problems there so always always cook meat in the United States we feed our livestock so many antibiotics and we don't have a good ecosystem anyway there's probably you're fine but in other countries, always make sure meat is completely cooked. Uh, and then there's also the liver fluke. And this one, um, also nasty. It lives in the bile duct in the liver in humans, cats, and dogs, and cattle. They're very small. Um, they, they're intermediate hosts. So their eggs, from what I understand, are released into the environment. And um, if a snail or a fish happens to come across those eggs, there's several in intermediate hosts that they go through until they get back to being around a mammal and then um, get ingested and there we go again they start over oh man yeah pretty bad so liver fluke uh wherever you start it it's it's a kind of a nightmare right so they have metasericae on grass that's um one of their metamorphic stages the cows and the sheep and the pigs and the horses eating the grass will in ingest those uh then um the as far as i'm aware the adult will go through its life cycle in that animal produce eggs the eggs will be shed from the animal and go into the ground, metamorphose into myricidium, and those myricidium then live in a snail and are released into cercaria that then go on to be metacercaria. Mess. But evolution's kind of cool, right? I mean, this is complicated. Evolution, man. Am I right? Okay. Class, class. Monogenea. I'll stop talking. It's getting long. Sorry. Monogenea. Class monogenea. These are ectoparasites that uh, attach to fish. They usually, um, they, depending on the species of, of monogenean, they'll either be found in the, on the skin, inside the gills, or on the fins of fish. Uh, they have a very direct life cycle, and some of them even give birth ovoviviparously. So uh, they either lay eggs oviparously, just lay eggs in the environment, broadcast spawn, um, internal fertilization, um, or, or they will... Uh, they will keep their eggs inside their body, they will hatch the larvae inside their body, and then release the larvae into the environment. Poor fishies, okay? And those uh, those larvae immediately attach to another fish, another host. Fish usually live um, in a community. So they'll find another fish and latch on with that um, opus that for opus that wow they have an anchor that they stick into the fish's um, tissues and then um, they use their oral sucker to suck the blood from the fish um, they can be pretty nasty again uh, if you eat fish you should just always take a look at the body take a look at the gills and make and take a look at the fins if you see any little white spots don't eat it don't eat it all right, wow, I'm done talking about that. Now I have the heebie-jeebies and I'm also freaked out about COVID. This is great. Today was great. I hope you guys learned something about something that you didn't know already. Um, your assignment for zoology class today, the coloring book pages, I will see if I can get those uploaded onto Canvas um, so that you can print them out and color them. If I can't and you are an online only student, do not worry about that one. However, there are reading and questions. Platy Helminthes, reading and questions on Canvas for you to do. Go read about them, parasites. Wow, I hate them. But I do love class Turbolaria so much so that you guys get to play with some Turbolarians in class next time. So hope to see you then. Have a good day. Have a good week. Please wear your masks and stay home. I really don't know why that's such a big stinking deal right now. Please, okay? Be good. Be kind. Be safe. Bye.